Mary Grace, you good to go to handle people coming in? Very good, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jeb Fisher. I am the TOSA in charge of data and assessment, which means I'm in charge of all data, research, and state testing and testing within the district across the board. My job is to support you and your efforts within the classroom and across the district as we report our numbers to each other within our classrooms, to the sites, to the district, and then further on to the state. So my role is to integrate that and help coordinate that for all parties involved and to make that as smooth an operation as possible. With that today, my role is to introduce to you the brand new NWEA testing environment that we're going to use for our district assessments. We're going to discuss how we got there, uh, why we've made this change, what that change means for you in terms of the classroom environment and the results you'll be getting. Then very quickly, I'll be taking into the system to show you live action on how to actually use the material and the process. My goal is to help feel, make you feel comfortable with what is going to be going on and give you some background knowledge to help assist you in that process. So with that, with no further ado, let me step forward and put a PowerPoint on the screen and get us moving forward. Jeb, I just want to say welcome to everyone. We have over 160, so far 165 participants, and we will be recording, so we make sure that people can um, review the material over and over. Thank you, Jeb, for getting our training ready. And this will help us as we assess students' progress over time. We will have one system that will help for elementary, middle, and high school. And Jeb is gonna give you all the details. We thank you for being here with us and building professional capacity. And with that, Jeb, let's begin. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham. So we need to discuss right off the bat, why are we purchasing a new system? There's several reasons, and I want to explain them briefly to you to make sure we're all looking at this in the same format. Starting off with, we lack a uniform execution district-wide. Some sites were very disciplined about getting district assessments done, some weren't. Some are more successful at reclassification or looking at support programs because of the resources they need to support their students. Other sites weren't as disciplined, as organized, or maybe just didn't have the right tools. We're going to work on that. We're going to fix this incomplete testing so it equates to because it equates to underreporting reclassification of ELD students. It resulted in unbalanced school budgeting and misapplies our efforts as a district as we try to support one another moving forward. We realize, or I realize, that we've had many legacy tools and programs that have got us here. Some of us remember ORs, EDEMS, IO, Illuminate, IABs or IECs, plus Mastery Connect, which is now called Mastery, so in case you see a different notice coming. All these things have been focused into the system that we've had to live with, deal with, transition to. This new product I'll be showing you today, we're living with for at least the next three years. It is a foundational product that's been around for about 40 years. We know districts in the nearby area have used it for 10 years or more. So this is not a new tool. It's not unexperimented or untested by others. We're just getting into the game and using it as well with them. We realize there's various tech skills across the entire district. The execution of this product, when I show it to you, is very simple. In fact, for those of you who've done SBAC testing, it's going to feel very similar, except for maybe the environment will look a little bit different, but the basic steps and the tools will feel very similar to you. And it's made to be used through a web-based system that'll help mitigate some of the technology issues we have across the district, whether that's iPads, laptops, Google Chromebooks, or other tools we have. And the previous programs didn't do a good job of reporting the data promptly to anyone, teachers in the classroom, the sites, or the district. This is gonna speed that process up the test results for one of these tests is 24 hours. The other major test that we'll introduce later on in the year is 20 minutes that the teacher can see the results and be actionable on them from there. So why are we doing about it? We've purchased into a program called NWA Growth Maps System. This is a longstanding product. It's gonna simplify our district-wide assessment process. This will be used from kindergarten through 12th grade across the board. It'll be one measurement tool that's gonna to provide for better, better support better resource allocation and better reclassification tools for all sites at all levels. It will require unification of testing. We will have very hard windows of testing, approximately three weeks in length. They will not be extended. They will not be played with unless we have some kind of district-wide uh, technical issue or a network crash. These dates and these deadlines will be firm. That's the only way we can manage the testing and make it equitable across the board. And it's going to bring this equity and access to all students by using these tools as an online system that automatically grades itself, reports to its or reports back to us quickly, and helps us move forward as a district. 
I want you to understand this is one of the things I had to learn too. We cannot escape the testing and accountability that we all have to do within the educational field. Even in my role, I understand there's probably too much at times and the value of it seems questionable, but what we can do is work to control it and to use it to our advantage to make things better for ourselves and our students. And making that happen is part of what I'm trying to help do for y'all. DIAs, as you've known them, are dead. The term is gone, the, the logic for them is gone. And I wanna explain why. The district interim assessments are based on standards and planning calendars, which were managed at times, managed better at some sites or different groups than others. And that created some of our inequity. We're going to change over a system called Student Measures of Academic Progress or SMAPs. The testing gives us different results. We're gonna be looking for different results. So that's gonna change our definition of what we're doing. We are no longer looking at a planning calendar or specific standards in these tests. These tests are literally all standards at a grade level or an educational level, and the performance of that students across time as they grow through the course of the year. We should expect them to come out low in the first test, but be much higher by the end of a whole year of instruction. And that is that growth pattern we're looking for. This is not an individualized test that's going to target a single skill or a single set of skills. It's going to target everything that we're looking to help them do across the year. So it's important to remember that S is for students. It's not about us as much anymore. These results are about what they're doing. And it's a measure of their academic progress. This is going to be non-stakes testing. There will be no final grade attached to this. There's not a A, B, C, D to this test. There's not even a, a per se level that we might get from CASP. It's not to be graded or used for placement overall. It's used to help direct our instruction and support the needs we have on, in classroom and at sites. The data is needed to analyze results district-wide so we can help support sites, to promptly inform you as teachers in the classroom to what's going on with your students and how to best support them, and help them plan the next instructional steps in order to meet and support students where they are. But we all need to remember, this is just one of many different measures we do as educators with our students. So whether we're doing writing tests, formative tests, other summative tests, this is not meant to be the end all of testing or assessment within this the system. The tests are given throughout the school year to measure each student's growth in English language, reading, math, and science. Uh, two rounds of testing will be mandatory for all sites at all levels. The third testing window will be optional based on the CAST testing or your individual site decisions by the administration involved. The practice assessments, which I will show you in a bit, will kind of be given multiple times to prep your students to get them ready, but there is no test bank. There is no way to pre-teach these tests. They are adaptive tests that have a very, very large test bank. Your students in the course of a year should never see these questions more than once ever. So there is no bank to pre-teach. The, the best way to pre-teach this would be to open up a CASP IEBs and use those, but even that would be too specific for the way this test is manufactured. The window for testing is on the screen for you right now. October 3rd through 21st, January 3rd through the 27th, and then April 10th through the 28th. And again, the first two windows will be mandatory for all sites at all levels. The third will be based on CASP testing or not, or site decisions. I know there's some curriculum teams who decide they're doing a third test because they want that third data point before the year is done. I'm going to wait for a moment because I see a lot of you writing and scribbling as we speak. And Jeb, if I may, just real quickly while they're um, writing Please. that down, people have already started, but if you could put your first and last name in the chat as well as your school, that will help us with timesheets. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to see if everyone's good and we can always get these dates back to you at a later time. So there's two major types of tests within this system. And I wanted to just briefly give you an overview of what they look like. And I'm gonna show you what those tests are as we move forward. There's map growth. And that is the primary test we're going to be giving to our students. It's approximately 43 questions long. And that's at every single grade level. So whether it's kinder all the way through the 12th grade, it's 43 questions. The resources and the districts we've communicated with suggest we always leave about 50 minutes to test. Having watched some of these tests being done at our, our pilot schools here in the district and at other sites, students are finishing these questions in 20 to 25 minutes on average. You're always gonna have the slower student or the faster students. But we don't wanna see happen is to find 
for instance, we all know that honors or AP kid or that A plus kid is going to want to stay there for four hours and get every single question right. This adaptive technology will not allow that to happen. It's looking for that range where a student is going to fail half the questions and get half the questions right. So even our best students should be struggling to try to succeed and they should not be capable of hopefully acing the entire thing. So we're looking for no more than about an hour-ish effort. The test is suspendable, it is possible to make that happen. It will get an overall subject score and will be detailed in reports so you can find out where their strengths lie within areas. For instance, math has four different critical levels within side of it. You'll get a single math score, but you as a teacher or later for reports for site or parents can dig down into those scores to find out whether it's a numeral problem, whether it's a, a functional problem, whether it's a concept problem, and be able to help define how you're going to support your students from there. The screening tests are only 20 questions long. These are used for new students who are not familiar with the overall subject. Maybe they've walked into your classroom late. Uh, maybe they've come too close to the overall testing window. So giving them the full test isn't very objective. It doesn't help us learn where they're at. But the screener gives you in the classroom some kind of tool to measure where they're at. It is only 20 questions long. It is The results are more static in terms of what you're looking for and shouldn't be repeated. But it can be definitely used for new students or for a new assessment on a student in, the, in your environment. This is the overall schedule for testing and the optional tests within the elementary school level. And I know that's where most of you are at. I know there are other levels. I'll show you those as well. You'll notice on the left-hand side are the three different scheduled maps, S maps, one, two, and three. That'll be the same for all calendars across the district. Then there'll be the growth reading tests for K1, K1 and two, math test K1, two. You'll notice Spanish math and reading are listed as optional. Every site, even if it's dual instruction, will be giving the English test first. Then based on site-based decisions and team decisions at those sites, if they choose to also give the Spanish test as well to help support their learning or measurements within the dual instruction, or if it's wanted to be used for ELD students, that'll be a site-based decision. Then you'll notice that tests switch. These tests are not specific by grade, they're in windows. So you'll notice it's K12 for reading and language. If you move down about halfway through the chart, you notice the language test is listed as grades two through 12 because this adaptive technology lets the students level rise or fall within that window as they test. So they'll enter that test at second grade. If they're successful, they'll stay there. If they're not, they'll come down to the lower end of two. If they're more advanced, they might rise up into the third level questions, third grade questions. So that window is large on purpose. Uh, you'll notice a reading 2-5 test, a math 2-5, and then science begins being tested at grade three. As a district, as a public district in California, science will become part of the California dashboard in 2024, which means as much as we are accountable for English and math, we'll also be accountable for science in the very, very near future. So it's time for us to integrate that into our overall teaching and our overall assessment so we can see where we're at and help support that process as well. Some of the sites represented here today by, by all of you being here with me also represent sites that have been piloting the fluency test. I'm not going to talk about much about, about it today, but it's a test of oral and reading skills from kinder through third grade. This is a different test than the one I'm going to show you today, but the system is similar. It is literally testing their, their phonics skills, their letter identification, their sentence building or identification in reading, and then moving forward into reading skills up and through third grade. That will be explained later. This window is open now for those tests in the schools who are doing it, but it requires some different tools that not everyone has, which includes headphones <clears throat> with a boom mic to record voices and other tools within the computer systems that we need to make sure are fully functional and stable before we introduce it to all levels. So we'll be looking to do that in the second testing window and the third, it'll be optional in the first for those sites who are ready, capable, or for those teachers who are ahead of the game technology-wise and ready to integrate. But I want you to at least see these as you knew they're there. For our middle school teachers, same testing window. I want to just keep hammering that idea home. It's the same for everybody, the same three weeks. But you notice the tests have changed as the grade level they represent and the window they represent in their testing has changed as well. So now language is two through 12. Reading is six plus. So is math. Science is six, eight. High school. The language test is the same, it's two through 12, remember. 
So your students come into the system with a grade level, the system knows to start them at that approximate grade level, and then has a window between second grade and 12th grade skills to find out where they're actually at. For my high school uh, instructors or administrators, you notice the science has two different windows. Uh, science 912 for life science is meant to be for biology students specifically. So if you have a ninth or 10th grader in biology, they should be taking that test. I believe that is a site-based decision. If they're in AP biology, they could take that test again as well. The other science, which is 9 through 12, is a general science for all other sciences. The test itself is an adaptive test. I just want to briefly try to give you an idea what that's like. It is driving itself, as you know, it's from left to right to find that range where the students are going to be successful half the time. It's trying to assess what they've mastered and can comfortably answer all the time. And those things they can't. And it's going to be driving their way through to that. It's going to generate what's called a RIT score. That RIT score goes onto a normative chart of growth and experience across all levels of education. You'll notice there are three bands, the lowest band being below average, the middle range is at average, and the dark green is above. Each year is individually sliced when it's reported to you as the instructor in the classroom, and their scores are placed upon this curve so you can see how they're doing. We would expect they start the first test low on that curve, or maybe the lower end, and then rise across the course of the year, just as this curve is constantly but slowly in cases rising. What we're looking for is that zone of proximal development, that range where they can do work independently at some level, the range that they need our support or our scaffolding to help teach them what to do, and the ranges they just don't have the skills for yet, so that we can properly instruct and support as we move forward. Having said that, it's enough time to look at my PowerPoint. It's time to actually show you the system itself. So there's two different ways to get into the system. One is through ClassLink itself. The link may have been already added to your system. If not, you can find it through the apps library. That'd be the plus sign at the top or left-hand side of your screen. You just hit the plus sign and type in NWEA, and you can add that button to your ClassLink if you use that on a regular basis. If not, the website listed is teachmapnwea.org. If you go directly to that site, it'll come into a window that looks like this. When you do that, I'm gonna step out and get into live footage. Give me one moment, please. Once we get to this website, the username is literally going to be your district email address, the full address with hlpusd.k12.ca.us at the end. You should have received an email early on in the year that should have been August 4th or 5th. If you didn't use it, if you didn't see it, that's fine. You can still come to this point, add in your district level email here, and then choose the forgot username or password to get in. It will email you an address and a temporary link to get you into the system. If you have technical issues, there is a form that's been put into chat that you can grab onto. Leave your notes there in case your email doesn't work, for instance, or if you log in and see something you shouldn't. My windows could be a little bit different than yours. As you notice on the left-hand column in dark blue, I've got more choices than the average teacher just because I had control of a lot more functions. But you should at minimum see manage test sessions. And for some sites, you should also see map reading fluency. Fluency, again, we'll discuss later if you're not already involved in that process. But today we'll be looking at test sessions in just a moment. A couple of things I want to point out for the times that I won't be here for you. Right off the bat, there's a help window here, which is incredibly useful. I want to show you what's there real quick. It's located at the upper right hand side of the screen. It includes some regular tools that you could use prior to testing or in the middle of a testing window when things get tight or something's not working right. That includes the Proctor Quick Start. This is a basically a PDF walkthrough of all the processes to actually execute a test. I'm going to show you those today, but I want you to understand that this resource is here for you if you need it. It does include short videos, it does include some schematics and some walkthrough steps. So if you ever get stuck, this is one tool to use to help yourself in the middle of the process. That'd be the Proctor Quiz Start. 
There's also numerous videos in support of this product and the different policies within it, different tools. There's the setup tool, there's technology access, map growth. There are also fluency videos here as well. This is all through the common help that's found at the top of the page. With that, I'm gonna take us back to home. Are you seeing my homepage at this point? The main front page, thank you. I just wanna make sure the vagaries of Zoom and we're getting all the transitions we need. From here, let's get into what this is actually going to look like. First off, we need to start and manage a test session. This is where on a daily basis, when this window opens up, use instructor will have to use. Hitting the test session button opens up this window. And there are literally three different ways to set up a test. The easiest way to do it, for most of you on a day-to-day -day basis will be to hit this grayed out button that I have right here called test my class. The system has been updated on a regular basis through our ARI system. Your students should be already populated in the system. So all you will have to do is hit the test my class button. That will open up a roster of your students into a testing window and it's ready to go. I would suggest of course you always check it to make sure everything's updated properly. It does get updated every night at midnight every single day of the week. I've got notices every single day. So that is one process. I'm gonna show you the other two steps in case you need these tools and there's some advantages to doing it this other way. The other method is to find students to test. This opens up a search function that allows you to search for the students that you want to have into your room. Why would you need this versus the my class button? Uh, if I work in let's say in a second grade level, and my neighbor next door has two more kids that didn't finish testing, or maybe they've missed the testing window for some reason. You could use this to put in your students and add other students into the room if you're going to help cover or support. If I were to be doing, let's say, a lunchtime testing of a couple of kids who needed more time from different teachers or instructors, I could use this session as well. There are different ways to do this search. You can execute it by looking for your school site. Uh, just ahead of time, as you look, this is a, a sandbox site, so the names and addresses and the student names I'll be using do not match anything we have. You can search by grade. In this case, I have two grades in, second and 10th. You can search by specific instructors. You can also search by classes. So in this case, I'm gonna use this example to find my second grade. And then we're gonna hit search. And again, an entire window of all the students that fit those parameters. These would be my students in second grade. I say my, because this is my sandbox. And I can go in here and actually choose who I want to include in this list. Maybe I know Alivi is out. Maybe she's gone on vacation for an extra three weeks and will be coming back for break in time to take the test. Maybe I know Prokopi is uh, out sick for some reason and will be back in time for testing. I can literally turn them off so they don't appear at this point in the process. There are other times in this window you can do that as well. I simply hit add students. And now they're all populated here, ready for me to go. This also allows me to do a couple of different things. As I'm creating this session, I want you to think of it like a bucket. This bucket we call a session, I'm now gonna put the students into, and then later I'm gonna put in the actual tests they take. This bucket can stay active in the system the entire year. And there's a reason I want you to consider that because we also need to consider the accommodations that each of these students might need. And that is an option that can be set up here and then saved for the rest of the year within this bucket that we're creating, this bucket we call a session. If you don't save it here, there's another chance to do it in the testing window, but that needs to be set up every single time you test. So for instance, in a classroom of 30 students, let's say you have six who have some kind of accommodation, you can either set it up here once and save the session as I'm going to show you, or Every time you open the test window, you have to go back in and find those six students and apply their specific accommodations every single time. I think it's more successful to do this ahead of time, save it, use it through the year, so you don't have to repeat that process. Let me show you how that's done. It's a simple matter of selecting a student. I'll take them all and then assign accommodations. Then all the accommodations that are in the system come in this pop-up window for you. I'm gonna assign him breaks. It's an English test, he might need a thesaurus. And you know what? He might actually need a bilingual dictionary because I know he's ELD. 
when I'm done, I can't see my own assign button, sorry. You notice as we look across his registry here, he's listed as having accommodations now, and they're in the system. I can do this for whatever students I need. And when I'm done, I can come down to the bottom and say, save session. If I do this once now, I never have to do it again the rest of the semester. I just need to check it and update it as things change or maybe an IEP changes. So I might recommend something like saying, hey, it's gonna be the 22, 23 school year. I wanna put my last name in so I can find it again. And maybe this is my uh, grade two class. Hit save and exit. This is now saved in the system for me to find. But Jeb, how do I find it? Let me show you. From this same window we started at, remember to test my class is your first choice. Find students to test is your second choice. But this little show button down here reveals all the tests that you have created ahead of time. All these sessions are waiting for you. In this case, I just finished making this test. I can select it and continue from there. There is an option on some of your sites that the administrators will have the ability to create these sessions for you or with you. If they do it from their uh, access to the system, that means they can create for any person on campus and then you could literally surf in here and find it. So for instance, I could come in and there's no one else here in the system right now, but I could search for my name, go to test session and see everything that was created by that person and then find the test for me. If you create, like I have three different sessions, you as a school room instructor in, the, in your room can only see your own tests. You cannot see the room next door or someone else in another grade level or the same grade level. You can only access your own tests and your own students. I'm gonna reopen the session by hitting edit session. And this is where we just were a moment ago. I can also from this window, select the test I wanna give all these students. I am again going to hit the check boxes, select all my students and do assign a test. Now this is a demo unit, so it's not gonna have all the possible options, but just know that based on the grade level you're teaching and instructing, this window should only show you the tests you have to choose from. So in this case, my demo is showing approximately 10 or 12 different options. You as a K2 instructor or K4 instructor might only see three options total the entire year. So these, these options will be limited to help support you in the classroom so you don't have to make all sorts of decisions. I'm gonna pick a demonstration test and assign it. Oh, but wait, you know, Nana, my third student here, you know, I know she's ELD. I know she needs a little more help. So you know what, I'm gonna change her test. I can deselect the entire class, select the individual student I need to find, and again, go back to assign test. Now I can change that test. Uh, I'm going to give her this Spanish reading test instead, because I think she'll be more successful in that. And at this point in her education, that's what she needs. You'll notice here that her test is now changed accordingly. So you can, in this bucket, be testing every student one time only, one test at a time, I should say. And that test is based on what you know they need. They finished the reading test yesterday. It's time for some of them to start the math test. You could set this up to be partially math, partially English. What you cannot do is set up everybody ahead of time. So I can't take Nana and give her her Spanish, her English, and her science all together at once. I can only assign one test at a time till it's done. But within this bucket we call a session, I could have kids doing multiple different types of tests, but only one student, one test at a time. That makes sense. Any questions on that? Okay, let me move forward from here then. Once you set up your class and you're feeling comfortable with the accommodations and the tests assigned, we just scroll down to the bottom. I believe I hit the wrong button. I hit save session. I'm going to resave it. Now, when I come back to show, I'm going to select it again, but this time I'm going to select, I would select test now, but it's fighting me. Hmm, interesting. Not the answer I was looking for. Well, we have our first technical problem for the day. Give me just a second. Interesting. 
My apologies, ladies and gentlemen, the system and I are having an argument and I don't know why. Ah, I see. Okay, here we go. There we go. Solve my problem. My apologies. You should be now looking at what's called the testing window. So now that you've selected your tests, you've selected your students, we're in the system. Um, the error I just corrected was my own error. That's one that you'll probably rarely find yourself. So we'll hopefully move on at this point. There's a lot of different things happening in this window, but it's meant to be for your control of the testing environment with the students in front of you getting ready to test. Where do we start? We're we'll starting in the upper left here with the session name and password. What I would do is I would set the session up as the students are walking in or before testing is going to start. Open this window up and I put this session name and number up on the board for them to use. This is what students will use to actually log into the system to access their materials and tests. I realize as I say this for kinder, probably some of the first grade classes as well, you probably want to do this in a small group instruction, small group setting, and you will do this process for the youngers. Since actually using the keyboard and identifying all the symbols and knowing where the letters are might take a lot longer in a whole class environment. Your discretion is absolutely respected in whatever you need to do. For the older students, put session and password on the board so they're ready to go. This is going to show you the number of students who are set up to take the test how many are actually in the effort of testing at that time who are active. And I'll explain what confirm and unconfirm looks like in just a moment. I wanna step out of this window for a moment and I wanna show you what a student testing window looks like. We're not gonna spend a lot of time in that window because it's very simplified from our point of view in terms of execution, but I want you to appreciate what they're seeing as well. So give me one moment to switch screens on you. So this is what a student will find out when they actually log into the system. They log into this by going to test.mapnwea.org. So sit here at the top of the screen, test.mapnwea.org. It'll open to this window. As we move forward through the course of the year, if you're using this testing on iPads, you'll notice your iPad should have already had an icon added to the desktop that actually is an NWEA secure browser login. All your students have to do is tap that and it'll automatically open to this window without any other execution. We are working for, on that also for all laptops, Chromebooks and other PC based devices. The system is a little sluggish at this point. We have some time before testing begins in October. So I want to hope to tell you that there'll be a secure browser link on the desktops as well. If there isn't, this is a, still the same login website to get to it and you can still use this as a function to get there. I was a bad student and I didn't write down the session name and password. So give me one moment. Okay, I wanna check. Are we back on the student window? Are we still at the student window? Can somebody give me a thumb up? Okay. From here, your students will enter in. The session name that was listed. Uh, by the way, capitalization does matter here. The session password provided. And hit the blue arrow to start. Now, from here in the growth map system, they'll have to open this drop down menu and select their name. This could be the only, uh, as I see from the execution point, problematic. What if uh, Mortas and Mishra grab the wrong one? What if they both log in at the same time? They could. I'm going to show you how at the teacher level you'll be able to see this and stop it before it becomes an issue. So, in this instance, I'm going to pick Nana. And then when she opens this, she will only see the test I've selected for her. 
because this is a sandbox and this is a demo, it's showing way too many choices. When Nana opens this herself, she'll literally see only the test I assigned to her. She'll hit the forward button. It's going to ask, hey, is this you? Nana, are you looking at your test at your window? Hopefully the student sees this and goes, my name is not Nana, and they'll back up and reselect the proper name. We all know that may not always happen, but at least it's a chance for them to correct the error. They hit yes. They can't go anywhere. We are now at what's called the proctor confirmation window. They're stuck waiting for you as the instructor to okay them to test and move forward from this point. So from here, we're gonna jump back to the instructor window. I wanna show you what's happening there. So back here in the testing window, some things have changed. If you notice, Nana is now waiting to be confirmed. Nana is right here in the middle of the screen. Her test assignment's listed. She's standing by for me to approve her test. This is my chance before things get going to make sure she's got the right test, that her accommodations are set, if there should be some for her or not, that it's even the right person ready to go. I could even take a moment and say, Nana, is that you? Are you ready to take your reading test? And she goes, yep. All I have to do is hit the confirm button and she can begin testing. What she's going to see looks something like this. You notice her window is now changed and it says, you are confirmed to start this test. Right across the top, this arrow was not active before, now it is. Now Nana hits the button. Ooh, there we go. Whew. Nana was gonna make a liar out of me. We get the test. This is a second through fifth grade reading test. I'm just gonna flash through it real quick so you can see the test types. Uh, please do not judge me on my answers. And this process will continue. Depending on the grade level and the type of test, these could include simple multiple choice. It does include matching, fill in the blank, selection. This same test at a high school level might be uh, put in the proper pronoun, there, there, or there. And you'll have to click it and actually put it in the right place. Actually, at the high school level, let me correct myself, you might get a sentence with three blanks and three there, 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 and there is to use. And you have to put them in the right place so that you have to show your understanding of what's going on. I wanna come back out and show what's happening at the teacher level. At the teacher level, I can see Nana is here actually taking the test. I can see she's gotten four questions in. So I can actually monitor the progress of what's happening to the students as they're moving through the test. This page will refresh approximately every 60 seconds based on the network or what's going on. You notice every time I got here, I've been hitting the refresh page just for impatience purposes. If you wanna wait for it or you walk away, it will refresh on its own. If you're trying to manage your students and move them through the class, just seeing the refresh page will do that for you. This is where we start things off. Now the test is moving. We've got 30 students going on. Nana raises her hand and says, uh, um, I need to go to the bathroom. Great, I select Nana out of the list and from the select action window, I've got some choices. I can choose to pause the test just like we do during CASP. That pause is approximately 20 minutes in length. So you can pause this test. It will mark it as pause. You'll see the notice coming up. And then on Nana's window, I'll show you in a moment, it actually comes up and says, this test has been paused. You can no longer progress. And she can go off and do her business and return. A couple quick notes about pausing and suspensions. If Nana finishes on test uh, question four and she's halfway through five, when I pause or suspend her, she will return to question five, but the system will automatically change the question she was looking at. It will not let a student look at a question and go, oh, I almost know this one. I'm gonna go to the bathroom, get the answer, figure it out, talk to a friend and then come back. If she does, or he does, 
they come back and restart the test, they'll be back on question five, but it will have refreshed the question from scratch and they'll have to start over from there. The other options that are here as well include suspend. Suspend would be used in case we have a student who doesn't finish a test in the allotted time. They would need the chance to come back to it again. Maybe it's lunchtime or break or just another day. Suspend holds the test for 14 days in the system. So there's a pause is a 20 minute pause, a short break. The other is a longer term effort. And then terminate is a button I hope you don't have to use very often, but terminate eliminates the test. Erases it, never existed. Why would you do this? Um, Nana wasn't paying any attention and it wasn't Nana's test. She's five questions in and goes, oh, I'm taking Trisha's test. Oh my God, what do I do? Well, what we wanna do is eliminate those results, start again. So termination is the elimination of the test at hand. Test again, student walks in and you know, because you know your students, that something's not right. Bad day at home, no sleep. Maybe they came to school sick. They give an effort and you know is far below par for what that student should be able to give you. Or you know they're distracted at a level that wasn't fair for them to test with. Test again, terminates and resets the test for retesting. Having said this, each of these test banks is well over, uh, they tell us, over 300 questions long. A student should never see the same question the entire year. So even the retesting doesn't give them back the same questions. It just re-enters them in the test bank again. It begins that process of leveling the test back and forth. So we'll leave Nana in pause real quick. I wanna show you what that looks like for her. Give me one moment. This is the screen Nana will see. It'll literally say your test is paused. The moving forward button is grayed out and inaccessible. And she's got approximately 20 minutes to go ahead and take care of her business and come back. When we come back, I would come back and select Nana and hit the resume button. This will come up and say, you can now resume and that gray button will come back to teal. She can hit that button and resume the test from wherever she left off. A couple of things I wanna show you in this window while we're here. If you forget what I showed you earlier about how to set up and save a session, or if you move too fast and come straight to test your class now, you can come in here and assign tests based on the students that are in the room. So I could come in here and say, uh, I need to set up a test for Vamal. I could pick maybe the six plus test because I know he's one of my advanced readers. I can also pick a student and go ahead and set accommodations here. But again, these are one-time only settings when this session, when this test window is over, so do the settings disappear. So there's a fault in the, there's a design choice in their system that if you do it from this window, all those accommodations your students may need have to be set up every single time you open this window. If you open it from the sessions I showed you earlier and save it, those accommodations come over every single time you reach for that bucket. That's why I suggest you definitely do the same session to save yourself that multiple effort. But it's here especially if you know something's changed or evolved in the student's IEP. You could add a student to the test window. Next door neighbor calls and says, hey, I've got two students who didn't finish. Can they come in and sit in your room to finish? You could have them stop, suspend the test in one room, come over here, add them to, the, to your session, and then continue the test with them as well. You could create a student from scratch, but I recommend you don't have to do this. Everyone's being updated in the system every night at midnight. Even a new student will be there 24 hours later. I don't want you to have to even use the student. Remove students with the same logic. Unless you know they're leaving the classroom, leaving the site, you shouldn't have to use the remove student button. There's this big window right here saying rapid guessing, guessing alerts. This is a unique function to NWEA that I want to explain to you real quick. We know as soon as enter these tests, some of them are just going to hit C. C, 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 as fast as humanly possible. This system is measuring that. For every single question that it puts into the system, it has an approximate completion time. For instance, if I give them a short passage to read as four or five sentences, and then even one or two multiple choice questions, it's going to take more than 10 seconds to read and answer properly. 
a student just clicks CNC and moves on, it's going to start tracking that. If it happens once or twice, the system won't necessarily stop them, but it will come up under this rapid guess column as a, as a building issue. So you might be able to look and say, oh, look, uh, Lisa is going a little too fast. Suddenly she's got numbers showing up. Maybe she's moving through things she doesn't know. Maybe she just doesn't care and she's clicking whatever she needs to click. If it goes too fast, if over 30% of the questions start coming up far, far too fast, the system will automatically pause the student. It will freeze the test wherever that's at. They'll come up with an alert on this window for you from this testing window and say, hey, we've paused the students. They're moving too fast for some reason. That gives you the chance to engage the students to find out what's going on with their testing. It could be a matter of resetting the test. It could be a matter of continuing the test. Maybe this is not the day they should test and you should choose that test again button. So there's choices here to help intervene before they complete the whole test and give you data and results. They're gonna lead you astray in terms of how to support them best. So this tool is here for you in terms of that process. When the entire session is done, you have two different options. If you know a lot of your students haven't finished and you wanna have a record of what happened today in this test, the download session progress button will actually download a simple PDF report to tell you where your kids are at. Did they finish? Did you leave someone on suspend because they went home for the day? Uh, were they paused and then never came back in time? Or maybe you didn't have time to have them come back to the session. This will give you a simple report to look at so you can have it for next time. And then the end session button closes the session and ends it for the day. And it's as simple as that. I've got about 10 minutes left, and I know I've got a lot that I've shown you already, but this is the testing window, and this is all there is to the actual execution. Select your students, add their accommodations, add their test, confirm and execute. And that is the process. The results for the growth test come back in 24 hours, and the report tools pop up after that for you to get to. We're not going to have time to cover those today. That's in session two, which I believe for you guys is scheduled for uh, September 28th if you're interested as the TOSA in charge of data and assessment. Part of my role is to create support materials and videos to help support this process for all of you. So I'll be producing PDFs and other videos to help support the location of these reports and the best use of those tools if you cannot attend the other session. With that and the time we have, I wanna give us a few minutes to answer questions as best I can. I see a lot of questions in chat. So forgive me while I come over here and see. Mary Grace or Ricardo, were you looking at these for me or with me? Yes, I think um, a lot of them have been answered on the Google Sheet. So I think okay. we're good, yes. Okay. Does anyone wanna come off microphone and ask any specific questions? I don't wanna leave you hanging in terms of content or what you need to see or hear. I have a question. Please, um, Thank you some more. I didn't know there was a Google Sheet, otherwise I would've asked a long time ago, but- That's um, fine. I have two questions. Um, I'm a K-5 RSP teacher. Okay. Um, I went into NWEA through my class link and I don't have any students. Is that because I am not their primary teacher? I do have a resource support class through Aries. That's so, probably- We're working on that. So as long as if you're an RSP teacher, the first step is make sure you do have your resource support class in Aries. Okay. If you have that that's the first step and then Jeb is working um, with our programmers and NWA to make sure that they roster that so we don't have it yet but it will be coming okay and then my next question is along the same lines if I have a I think if I heard you right you there's two kind of tests there's a k2 and then there's a 212 Correct. if I have a third grader or fourth grader working at first grade level am I still giving that 212 or or which, which way you want to see that test go yeah because if you're saying it's going to be as low as second grade but if they're lower than that they won't be successful either way i think correct right? well you're also doing rsp so you, you know you've got students who are below level right. in the first place so your considerations will probably be different than the than the average student or the average classroom. I would probably recommend you do the lower test of the two okay. choices. I didn't know that that was an option. So that's well, what, what you need to consider is the window that's listed on that test is the window that, that it will adjust as it adapts to the questions or the skills of the students. So if you do K2, it's going to bounce from two down to K, but it won't bounce up to three. 
Right. If you do the two through five, or let's say the language is just two through 12, it'll bounce as low as two, but could go as high as 12. Okay. We have the same problem in the math department uh, for those of you, for everybody. There is an integrated math test. So we can actually test high school integrated math, just like we teach it. But the window of balance is only inside of integrated math. If that student's skills are poor and they're really more of an algebra one student, it can't bounce out. If we put them in math six plus, which is six all the way through senior year, now we've got a large window to bounce through and see exactly where their skills are at. And so when you see those reports, RSP or average, you're going to see the level, you're gonna get a score and you're gonna see where their skills are at. So they might be strong in some areas, let's say shapes, but they might be bad at angles. They might be good at the numeretical, but not bad at the formulaic. And you'll be able to report that so you can see that better and support them. That, did you. that help answer? Yes, perfect, thank you. You got it. Uh, Miss Nadler, you had a hand up? I don't know where you're at, but I saw a hand. Yeah, let me figure out where to unmute. Um, so my question is at the middle school level, if we can only give the tests to one student, at a, well, no, my question is, can a science teacher give the test on the same day that say the math teacher is giving the test so the student would have two tests, but given by two different teachers, because you said only one test per time, but that was when you were talking to K-5. My apologies. Let me clarify that. I, what I said was right, but it's per teacher. So you set up your bucket, your session, and you're going to give science, for instance. Your next door neighbor could be setting up their bucket teaching math and give them that same student could be the next period taking a math test. It's just that in your room, you cannot assign science and math and English at the same time okay. to that one student. But across the course of a day, yes. They could take separate tests in separate rooms with separate teachers. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good question. Thank you. Any other questions I can help support everyone with? Ms. Willis, I see a hand up, a physical hand. Yeah. Hi. Hi, I just have a question. Are we going to, is this recorded so we can watch it again or? Oh, dear Lord, I hope I hit the record button. Yes, I did. So awesome. yes, it'll be recorded. We're going to post it on the CIA site. Uh, yesterday's training session, which was very similar to this, is also posted there as well. So look for today's date to separate the two. And this is part one, right? There's a part two? Correct. Part two is going to move past this and get into the reporting. So if this is how to get the data by testing our students, part two will be about how do we look at the reports? What do the reports look like? How do we use those to support our classroom instruction or site-based decisions? Uh, and then one more question. Um, I noticed, and I stepped away for a second, but what, did the kids put in passwords or just the session ID and pick their name? Uh, for growth map, all they do is session ID and the session password, which is on that testing window. Yeah. Then they pick their name and away they go. Okay. I'm sorry, name, name and test. But if you've done your job by picking the test for them, they should only see that one choice. One choice, but there's no password or anything for them. It's just the session ID and their name. Correct, session ID and the session password. Session password that I give them, but it's right. all the same or is it different for each kid? It's the same for every kid to get Got in, it. but then that's why they choose their name to see exactly what you've given them. Okay. That makes sense. Got it. Okay. I had a question. Please. Uh, yeah. I teach first grade. How does it look like again for kinder and first grade teachers? Are the students listening to the question being read to them? Uh, actually, Rachel, have you done that part of the test? Rachel was piloting some of the fluency. I want to see if she's still here. Yeah. So if you're doing the K2 test, um, all the past, everything is read to them. Um, if you go to the second through fifth grade test, that's when it changes. And if they have an accommodation for text to speech, you would have to turn that on. So if you have a second grader, you have two options there, but you're going to need to determine which one, you know, that's why we're, we're, we're specifying which one maybe in the end of the year will be different, but K2, everything's read to them. So you should be fine with that. So that the challenge is just getting them on, logging them in if they, <laughs> they can. Yeah. And, and seriously, that will be the challenge, especially the first time. And we know, and I want you all to feel comfortable hearing this. We know this first year, these first couple of runs are gonna be complicated. It, it is simple, but still the execution the first time of all of this is gonna be rough. We know that. A, a really helpful thing for the little ones is having them use either their touchscreen laptops or if they have the iPads because they can drag and drop. Um, for them to use a mouse and try to drag and drop is really complicated. Um, also, we found that a lot of it mirrors similar to like Lexia. So the kids that have been using that, they, they, they're pretty intuitive to figure out like, oh yeah, I have to put this in the box or this goes there, um, that they're, they're catching on a lot quicker um, if they've had practice with that. Great, thank you. Absolutely. 
I have another question. Yes, ma'am. About accommodations. Mm -hmm. um, you had said that like you set up the kids at the beginning and then they're all set ready to go. If, if, if and when I get my class together, if I put in an accommodation for a student, will it show up in their teacher's class? No. Oh, okay. No. Sorry to say it literally travels only with the teacher with the session that's created there. Uh -huh. The exception to that would be is if at the administrative level, they created the session, mm -hmm. then, well, no, I take that back. They could create a session for each teacher that, so let's say, let's take Bobby. You've got Bobby and his five needs. You could, the, the administrator could create the session for every class Bobby's in and make sure it's set up correctly for him. Then those teachers have to go find that bucket. Okay. It gets more complicated, but it can be done. And some sites have done it that way. Okay. Uh, but that's more of an administrative choice in terms of that execution. Okay. I would suggest at that point, Rachel, correct me. It's going to be really up to you then to make sure the other teachers know what right. Bobby needs to help right. support his needs okay. moving forward. Perfect. So they Thank can put you. that in when they test. Thank you. You got it. Miss Lee, I see a hand up. Miss Lee, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Are you on mute? Or your volume's off? Okay, can you there hear me go. now? Okay, yes. sorry, I guess my microphone was off. Um, does that include, for the uh, K to two, does that include TK as well? It does. I believe at this point, we're not expecting to test TK. Okay. If, you, if you're ready and want to try and do it, you're, there's nothing wrong with that. It's set up to do it. And the tests are, are accommodate TK in that same TKK level. Uh, but at this point, we're just happy if we can get K through 12 going. Okay. So All right. Depending on your resources and your skills, you're welcome to try. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you got it. And let me add to that note that for everybody, this year is going to be rough. This testing window is starting a little late in October, and we're trying to get all three tests in before the year is done. Next year's calendar will probably be very different. The first test will probably be after only four weeks of instruction so that people can warm everyone up from summer, get the basic instruction given to them test them right away to see where they are in that, that normative growth pattern. And then the other two tests will show a better growth across the year. This year, everything's coming in a little late. We're starting things as we go quickly. So the test windows will be different as well. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording here, if you don't mind. <laughs>